Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Right, we should be recording now. My name's Tim. I'm alcoholic. Also a member of Al-Anon. Um, and it's very interesting that the numbers were down when we were talking about amends, and they've shot right up now we're talking about self-esteem. It's a favourite topic, isn't it? Everyone thinks they got low self-esteem. <laughs> well, we're going to look at that. <laughs> um, so some people know me, some people don't. I've been sober since 24th of July, 1993. I, I've had a, a relationship with Al-Anon since, uh, ooh, um, September 1995. Uh, and those are the two main things I've done that have helped. Self-esteem. Uh, what's the problem? Well, certainly before I got to recovery and certainly before I was even drinking, so when my al was the only condition that was active because that started very early. I was aware, I was aware of having something which would conventionally be called low self-esteem. So I never felt I was good enough. You know, it's the sort of, um, when you go to speaker meetings, people usually go on for about 20 minutes about when I was a child. I always felt separate. I always felt different. I never felt I was good enough. It's a standard Standard spiel. I felt inadequate socially. I wouldn't, didn't look good enough. I was not good enough at sport. Um, I mean, in my case, there were more dramatic manifestations than that. There was some um, quite uh, virulent self-harm going on and suicidal ideation and suicidal thoughts. Um, I, I won't get graphic, because I know it triggers some people, so there's no need to get graphic, but I did some very graphic things which would be very graphic if described. And constant negative self-talk. Um, but if you scratch the surface, if you scratch the surface of this, this what appeared to be low self-worth, there was a lot else going on underneath. It wasn't the only thing going on underneath. It was the thing that was most obvious on the surface. But the the first interesting thing about low self-esteem is, so I had a very low opinion of myself. Now, most people will have had other people in their childhood who corroborated that low opinion of themselves. I did. There were people that said, oh, you're a worthless this, or you're you're a this, you're a that, you're a the other. Uh, Most people have been bullied by someone. Um, But frankly, there were lots of people that said, oh, you're wonderful, we love you. And even if it was just the odd teacher here and there, people, uh, it was a mixed bag. There were people that showed me kindness. There were people that treated me with respect. There were people that treated me as I was worth something. It would be a really exceptional situation if no one tr- would treat a person with respect at any point. I, I'm always very skeptical of monochrome depictions of childhood by people in recovery. I just don't believe them, frankly. Um, I know that's red rag to a bull, but there we go. There we have it. Um, now, so I had different messages coming in. Because people will often blame low self-worth on the messages that came in. But frankly, the messages were mixed. I was the one who picked the negative ones. So I've known a lot of people who had low self-worth before AA and in, in recovery. And have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone else who's got low self-worth? And you try and tell you've got everything to live for. You're a wonderful person. And they argue with you. 
I used to argue with people. People would say, oh, we love you, or you're good at this, or you're good at that, or you're good. And I would argue with them. I had a very high opinion of my evaluation of myself. I was not to be disagreed with. I was not to be countered. That's not really low self-worth. There was certainly self-hatred, but I had a very high opinion of my own ability to evaluate the value of a human being. And that was reflected throughout the rest of my life. Um, I was very quick to mock um, others, to hold them in contempt, to treat other people casually. So my self-hatred was really, it was really a universal phenomenon. I, I wasn't the only person it was reserved for, this contempt. It shot out in all directions, all sorts of people. Uh, what, is it, what sometimes gets called attack thoughts. Um, attack thoughts against me, attack thoughts against you, attack thoughts against society, attack thoughts against the system, attack thoughts against uh, you name it. Just wherever I looked, I would attack. Vengeful, mocking, gossiping, undermining people's reputation, taking glee in that. But also, now Clancy is very good on this. He describes a phenomenon where he said, if you treat me as okay, I feel terrible. If you treat me as special, I feel okay. Uh, I was, when I felt low self-worth, very often it was because, not because I wasn't good enough, but because my good enough was being better than you. Being average, being average was not, that was not on. I had to be number one or nothing at whatever I turned my hand to. And if I, if it was evident that I was not going to be number one or in the top ranks, I wouldn't even bother or I'd sabotage. And a lot of what passed for low self-worth was actually thwarted entitlement. I had this entitlement to be superior, to be praised, to be, to be singled out. It would have been no value to me to be part of a crowd that was praised. I wanted to be singled out. I didn't want to be part of a choir. I wanted to be the soloist. And if I couldn't be, I felt worthless. Now, there are, there are, I have met, I, I met someone many years ago in AA who had what I think was a really genuine case of low self-worth. There was no entitlement in this person at all. They, they really did not presume to take up any space at all. Um, that's not the form that I suffered from. And I've sponsored a number of people over the years, <laughs> Not as many as my sponsor has sponsored, but I've sponsored a number of people over, over the years. And that real, the, the, the real humble form of low self-worth is very rare. In almost every person I've talked to at depth, it turns out they're a little bit like me. Thwarted entitlement, touchy, oversensitive. Um... What else? Um, what else can be said about the phenomenon before we get on to the solution? Um, a good example is the uh, you get a, a spot of tomato sauce on your white shirt and you're filled with shame and embarrassment. You're at a meeting and you mispronounce one word when you're reading the preamble. And you have to make a show of yourself because you're so embarrassed. You know, and people that when I, and I've done this, other people do it too. You don't just correct the word. You go blah, 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 to try and distract from the fact you made a mistake because you're so embarrassed at having made a mistake. You have to make a show of it, turn it into performance. Um,
It's a complicated phenomenon, but luckily the answer is going to be pretty simple when we get to it. Now, for years, AA is very helpful. My sponsor was very helpful. He was of the pragmatic sort, and he said, in AA, we get self-esteem by doing estimable things. Now, this is a very good philosophy for a while. So I learned how to do uh, 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 to become a worker amongst workers, I think is the phrase from step 12 in the 12 and 12. I learned how to show up. I learned how to uh, apply for a job and get a job and keep my nose clean whilst performing the job. <laughs> I learned how to look after myself in all sorts of practical ways. And this was good. So treating myself as though I was worth something was, was, was very good. But the da- here's the danger, and it, it's a terrible danger. Uh, I think it's all very well saying we're going to get self-esteem by doing estimable things. But the trouble is, what is an estimable thing? And even in that little list that I've just mentioned, we've got getting a job. What happens... Uh, when I get sick and can't work. I started to base my, to develop a self-worth, a self-esteem in AA uh, from being a good boy, from from doing the steps well, turning up at my home group, being a good AA member, um, being a productive, constructive member of society, getting all the normal trappings of job and house and uh, I got a boyfriend, we moved in, we bought a nice big house together. Not that big, but you know, big enough to be called a big house. Um, everything was good. I was looking, I was, I, w- I was, I, this is the point. I was managing very well. I was managing very well right up until the point I stopped managing very well. The trouble with building self-esteem in the world is that the solution is not symmetrical to the problem. The problem, as we'll come to, was from deep down inside, and I was trying to fix it with external means. When I was drinking... I was very much the, you know, the the kind of drunk, this is the kind of drunk I was, uh, sitting on a tube platform, subway platform at seven in the morning, drunk, raucous, with friends, mocking all of the commuters with their uh, dull, tedious, conventional lives. And I got my identity from being an outsider. In AA, I flipped I started to get an identity from being an insider. But there's a line from a Sondheim musical, a slotted spoon doesn't hold much soup. And I was a slotted spoon. The problem was on the inside, but I didn't fully realize it. Pouring soup (laughs) into that did not solve it because there were holes in me. Whatever external things I did or achieved did not get rid of the fundamental of, fundamental dis-ease. They acted as temporary balms, ointments, and bandages to the fundamental problem. And just like with alcohol, I needed more and more to get less and less of an effect. So I started to feel inadequate in a job which had given me self-esteem one year earlier. It was no longer enough. It was no longer hitting the mark. Just like with drinking, at the beginning of my drinking, I'd drink half a bottle of gin and be be completely unconscious. At the end of my drinking, I'd drink half a bottle of gin. I'd, I'd, I'd have wetted my lips. That was all by the time I'd had half a bottle of gin, not even on the way. And it's like that with doing estimable things. They have less and less of an effect. You need more and more, and you up the ante, and you up the ante, and you end up, I ended up at seven 
and a half years sober with, you know, that wonderful cat little catchphrase people use. I've got a big life. I had a big life. There was a lot going on in it. Spinning lots of plates. I had, uh, I'm going to go into, I don't normally go into details on this, but I'm going to, because I think it's relevant. Um, my first job when I got sober, this was 1993, was, was uh, I buttered slices of bread in the canteen of uh, a firm in, in, in the city in London. So I was a, I was a bread butterer. Uh, by the time I was seven years sober, I was the finance director of one of the dot-coms. Um, we had uh, 130, 140 employees in three different countries. I was jetting over over to Australia and to Germany and to different places. We were burning through hundreds of thousands of pounds of other people's money every month. Um, uh, It was an absolute nightmare uh, trying to keep the thing going, constantly raising money from investors. Um, Spinning plates. The other directors were cocaine Users. I don't think they were addicts, but they were users. Um, now, it didn't come crashing down. I, it almost did on several occasions. But boy, did I crash. Because I could not keep up with how I had to perform out there in the world to try and treat my sense of dis-ease. That's why I got that, ended up with a a job like that, is because the prestige and the pressure, and I was getting my self-esteem from this enormously estimable thing. 130, 150 people relying on me, all of these investors relying on me. Estimable, deadly. Uh, And I crashed and I had to start again in all sorts of, it, it, with career, I went in a different direction. I do something very different now. Uh, the relationship went to the house. We sold the house. Um, this method, which I practiced for seven years, getting self-esteem by doing estimable things. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy today. Disaster. And you want to know why it's such a common thing between seven and 12 years, people in AA collapse. This is, I think, one of the big reasons why, is the focus is on building a life ultimately to get self-esteem, to feel like you're worth something. You're looking after yourself finally, but it's all on the outside. We're back to the George Carlin line of trying to um, uh, secure happiness with anything from the material world is like trying to treat hunger by taping sandwiches to your legs. It doesn't get where it needs to get. It was healthier than what I was like before I drank, but it wasn't more effective. And ultimately it was just as unhealthy in the final analysis. The other side of this if i get my self-esteem from doing an estimable thing in the world so i i turn up at my meetings i do my service i get a job i pay my taxes i give money to charity um there's a radiohead song about this about a pig i'm not going to go into the lyrics here i didn't look them up before but some of you will know the song How am I going to treat people that can't or won't live that way? Most of my family are are or have been very ill. One of my sisters was mentally ill uh, and mentally handicapped. She died last year, poor old thing, in her 60s. And inside, I realized that the flip side of me getting self-worth from my career was that part of me looked down on her. Now, I realized rationally, it's completely insane to do that. But I would, and this is not, this is not, I'm not proud of this, but I'm going to say it. I looked at her uh, with her very small, very humble life. Uh, She had the mental age of a seven-year-old. 
obviously she couldn't have a career in the ordinary sense of having a career. I looked at her and said, what's the point? Because the point of my life was something that was not available to her. Now, this was, I realized, of course, I realized this was grotesque, and I pushed it all the way out of sight. There was a video I saw on Facebook. It was one of, you know, those things that go viral. And it was a video from a street camera in, in Rio de Janeiro where a bloke in a suit is walking past some kind of bum drunk and asleep on the pavement and he kicks him on the way past and it went viral and it's not hard to see what's going on there if my value comes from something some kind of external performance in the world i if my value comes from that someone who cannot do that is valueless becomes an object of contempt The whole system is disastrous from top to bottom. I would classify, and you see this in AA as well, I've done it, and I've seen other people do it. You get your self-worth from doing the program, and you develop contempt for people that don't, and dismissiveness. And it's deadly, and I've worked very hard to root that out and develop compassion and understanding and to look at things from a very, very different angle. The other thing is, uh, in my 20s, I wasn't very well physically. I had completely unrelated to alcoholism. I had a very serious liver problems, and I almost died at one point. Or rather, I, I developed a liver disease, which was serious enough to kill me. There was a two-week period when they didn't know which way it was going. I don't want to over-dramatize it, but that was the fact. Um, it was something I could have died of. I didn't. And I realized myself, as soon as I got very sick, I had to take several months off work. As soon as I got very sick, my self-worth plummeted because I was no longer able to perform in the thing which was giving me self-worth. And I, re- I can't live like this, I realized. So what happens when you fail? What happens when you get sick? What happens when... Uh, your industry changes and you can't work in the same way anymore. Your industry disappears. You're back at square one again. So this is AA solution number one, or, or not AA solution. It was some AA member's solution. It's not, it's not an AA principle, that. It's an AA member's principle, getting self-esteem by doing esteemable things. There's um, another little... AA member solution. I'm not sure it's in the big book. Uh, Certainly not in the basic text. We're going to love you till you can learn to love yourself. Now, um, as I said earlier, I was bullied uh, pretty badly as a child. Um, When I look back at my behavior, I invited some of it, but obviously it it still shouldn't have happened. I didn't deserve it, but I did did invite it. Um, But there were lots of good people around as well. Uh, Love doesn't fix this. Really doesn't. Love from other people in the conventional sense does not fix this. Um, Bill W. was the fa- one of the co-founders of AA, his wife, Lois. There's a book about Lois called When Love Is Not Enough. And this is one of the key messages of Al-Anon. You can love someone all you like, and you can love them emotionally. You can hold them in high esteem. You can tell them you, that you love them. You can tell them how important they are you can do things for them you can hoover for them you can dust for them you can cook for them and it will not treat it won't dent their alcoholism or their underlying condition the trouble is what's going on inside which we'll come to don't worry we're getting to that (laughs) what's really going on the trouble is with that it's so complex and messy What happens when you try and love someone who's in that condition that I was in? 
of the self-hatred and the conceit all rolled into one. If you loved me because I had contempt for myself, I lost respect for you as soon as you said you loved me. Uh, so all the people that buzz, buzzed around me in my early days in AA uh, with a sort of softness and gentleness and kind, I, I couldn't stand them. It, was, I felt, I, it felt invasive, it felt intrusive. Um, and what, is, what did that love mean? You consider me valuable. Well, people have been telling me I was valuable in certain ways as a kid, and that was the fuel for my sense of entitlement. I was good at a couple of things, and I was put on stage, and I performed. Um, that was actually fueling the problem. That was developing my sense of specialness. What is the measure of that love? What does love actually mean? Uh, especially in the, in the family I grew up in, uh, love could be transactional. It was giving something to get. The love I'd experienced before I ate could turn on a sixpence into hatred. Special love relationships very easily become special hate relationships. It's based on, they were based on separating me off from everyone else and putting me on a pedestal, and I would do the same for the other person. Um, when people said they loved me, often it meant that I represented some value to them. It was, I was a commodity. Love can mean sexual love, it can mean romantic love, it can mean familial love, the deadliest one of all. Um, love was often accompanied by an inconsistency between words and actions. So you throw the word love around as being the solution to this. You've got to be very careful what you mean and how it's going to be heard. I very rarely, so I very rarely talk about that because I, the trouble is with, with talking about love. Um, there's a line in A Course in Miracles. It said, revelation is literally unspeakable because it is an experience of unspeakable love. And the people that have loved me most genuinely and authentically in my life haven't had to say so. That's, to me, very interesting. I think AA does show a different form of love, and this is where AA really does come into its own. Um. Love and service. So Bill W. and Dr. Bob talked about love and service, and they're intertwined. Uh, spiritual and altruistic. And AA demonstrates love without having to say a word about it. When, you come, when I came to AA, I talked absolute horse twaddle. And people said, thank you, at the end of my sharing. It was no, there, was, there wasn't any effusive, oh, thank you so much for being here, and we love you, and blah, blah, blah. No, just thank you. The same thank you that everyone else got. It put me on a level with everyone else. So you get to stay even if you talk horse twaddle. You get to share even if you talk horse twaddle, right? You have to stop at three minutes, but you still, you still get to share. So people were polite. They weren't effusive. They weren't intrusive. They weren't insincere. But they did say thank you. When I arrived, they said, good to see you. Tea's over there. I got treated not as special, because special love is, is where the problem starts. I got treated as unspecial, as, as part of the gang, an invisible but necessary part of the gang. Not above, not below, but just with, part of. This is why I think a, the, the layout of chairs in AA meetings is very important. When it's theatre style, it's a disaster because you can't see anyone. If it's in a circle, it works. Or if it's in the round on three sides, at least everyone is looking, is able to see everyone else. It, you're not pointed towards an external object. You're pointed towards each other. 
It's complete. The love that AA showed me was completely impersonal. I didn't have to do anything to merit it. And there was nothing I could do that would remove it. I remember someone who suffered from a desire, a terrible desire for specialness, as did I, which was what this low self-worth was about. She presented as having very low self-worth. And we had, we've had conversations about this since then. And we're at a meeting, and she was crying after the meeting, and demonstrated was performing low self-worth. But she said, do you love me? As I was her sponsor. She said, do you love me? I said, I do. She said, yeah, but you say that to everyone. <laughs> do you love me for me? She wanted a special form of love, which was distinct from what, she, what I was giving to someone else. You see? There was love there. She didn't want love. She wanted something else. And my search for love before I got to AA was not a search for love. It was a search for specialness. But what I had to offer for that specialness, I knew was worthless. It was a trade where I thought I was going to come off better. I'll say more about that later on. Um, my value as a human being was demonstrated to me by my first proper sponsor, Doug. As I always joke, I had a number of improper sponsors before I had a proper sponsor. My first proper sponsor, Doug, uh, I found him impressive in lots of ways uh, in terms of his uh, demeanor and bearing, his comportment, his mood, his attitude, his way of handling people, and his external life was interesting. The very fact that he gave me his time, his resources, his attention, not necessarily very much at a time, five-minute phone call, ten-minute phone call, that was enough to tell me that I was worth saving. That action showed me a lot more because he wasn't paid to do it either. That's the difference with professionals. That's why tradition mm -hmm. eight is so important. And he, this is the other thing. He didn't want anything back. The other people who tried to help me, they wanted something back. My survival or recovery before AA was important to them personally. So it didn't mean anything to me. Or it was important to them professionally. So it didn't mean anything to me. But Doug was... Doug didn't care. If you, if you want to get well, great. If you don't, great. <laughs> Your choice. Kevin in East London, uh, he, he tells a story about where he would go to his sponsor and say to his sponsor with tears running down his face. If I drink, what will you do? And his sponsor said, I won't like it, but I won't worry about it. It's an, it's an impersonal form of love. Uh, and this is underlined in the tradition, tr tradition one that we're all one. It's not individuals. We're all one. Um, the very, very low bar for membership in Tradition 3, for whatever the fellowship is, uh, uh, nothing else is required. We really let pretty much anyone in, provided they're alcoholic. Um, there's a basic message in that, which is I'm invaluable simply because I exist. And that value is not conferred by any personal attribute of mine. It's conferred by my existence because I exist, I'm worth something. No more and no less than anyone else. Nothing I can do can add to that. Nothing I can do can take away from that. I had a value system looking at the world where some people were more valuable than others. Have you noticed? I don't know if anyone has seen any television programs in the last decade or two 
There's a lot of killing in them. And there's a lot of sex in them. Specialness and death. The people that we want close and the people that we want to be destroyed. And it's amazing being able to watch... um, well, obviously, I can't say the name, but it rhymes with Thrain of Gones. Um, watch it with your popcorn or your ice cream. Having you, I remember sitting, having my dinner, enjoying people being gored and obliterated in front of me. That's the thing that you don't want to see in yourself. And AA is the antidote to that. This dividing up of the world into the people that I want to hold close, the people I'm indifferent towards, and the rest who I'm quite happy to see destroyed. You see that when there's a... a, People want... You you see people marching up and down in front of the High Court in London. We want justice! We want justice! They don't want justice. They want retribution. Vindication. AA is the antidote to that. Nothing I can do... No, we... I cannot sink. I cannot sink so low. Uh, by God, have I tried? I cannot sink so low that AA can reject me. That is the message of AA. It's not by doing estimable things. It's by being accepted and given a cup of tea, regardless of the quite unestimable things I've been up to. No one can sink, this is straight from the big book, no one can sink too low. I would be welcome provided he means business. If I have business here, you'll let me in. Um, And page 28 of the big book, if what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed or colour, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we're willing and honest enough to try. So the phrase, the, the, the get out here, the, the trap door out of the hell of the, that, low self-worth, conceitedness, and specialness mess is this idea, I'm a child of a living creator. Whatever force is creating, I am an offshoot of that. Therefore, I'm made of the same stuff. Basic principle. Um, uh, A cat gives birth to kittens. It cannot give birth to something which is not cattish. It can only give birth to cat-like things. If I'm a child of a living creator, then that is what I am. I'm I'm not at the same level because I'm not the origin, I'm not the source, but I'm made of the same substance. The sun and its rays, the dancer and the dance. So that is who I am. I'm not my body. I'm not my physical form. I'm not my performance in life. I'm not any individual virtues or characteristics or or defects. I'm not my own defects. That's why the the step four is fearless, is because you're not looking at you. You're looking at your defects, and you are not your defects. If they were you, you'd have to be frightened because... It, they'd call down retribution. Because they're not sin, they're error, they call for correction. And that which requires correction doesn't call down retribution. Sin does. And that's the key correction as well. This is a major correction which takes place in step four. This is a, it's a fact file, it's a moral inventory, it's a fact-finding expedition, not a moralizing expedition. We simply neutrally trot out the facts to other people in AA. The more, the merrier. And they are the same afterwards. They treat people in AA when I've shared inventory, treat me the same afterwards as they did before, which tells me that those things that I did are not me because they're reacting to me the same, even though they've now heard the things that I did. Uh, Now, I've got possibly a slightly kooky take on where this low self-worth really comes from. It gets hung on all sorts of hooks, like 
you know, childhood experiences and bad messages and so on. But but that doesn't really add up. You'll, you'll, you'll see families where the kids um, are treated the same by the parents, essentially treated the same, so the same negative talk. One kid comes out of it fine, the other one doesn't. Why is that? It's, it's, it's not, it's part, it's not the whole story. There's more going on. Um, my view of what happened before dawn in my consciousness. Um, uh, and this is an idea that you get in various different spiritual traditions. You, you get it in Judaism, Judaism, the idea that kids are born knowing everything and an angel touches the, uh, the upper lip and makes them forget everything. And then the rest of your life, you're, you spend trying to retrieve the knowledge of heaven that you originally had. Um, what's on offer is oneness. It's being part of the celestial choir, just being one of, uh, dissolved into the unity of the universe. It's as though part of me said, that's not good enough for me. I want to be special. I want to be individual. Damn your unity. Damn your heaven. It's dull. You know how in the, in the culture, heaven is per perceived as a place which is unbear unbearably dull and boring. Who would want to be there? Why? Because there is no specialness there. I grew up identified with my physical form, thinking my physical form was who I am. I think this is pretty universal. And the game of life was essentially a game for securing a special position in the universe through looks, through achievement, through status, through sex, through power, through prestige, through money. But it's all competitive. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about the great sin of pride. You want to get the girl, not because you want the girl, but because you don't want the other bloke to get the girl. You want to be the one that got the girl. Um, Marks and Spencer's had this slogan, exclusively for everyone. If it's for everyone, it's not exclusive. If everyone gets a prize, the prize doesn't mean anything. The Prizes are valuable only if they're selective, which means I'm in competition with the rest of the world. I've somehow rejected everyone so that I can be in the spotlight and I can be the center of attention. I can be the winner. I can be on the pedestal. Now, the trouble is, to acquire that specialness, I've got to destroy everyone else. This is, if anyone, I haven't seen the Squid Game, but I've heard about it and I've seen the trailers on Netflix. It's a race to the death. That fundamental rejection of and hatred for others because they're competing for the same special spot in the sun, that is the source of my low self-worth because I'm literally attacking the rest of humanity in seeking to be special. Except that's so horrific, that attack is so horrific. I don't like to see it in me, so I see it in you. So it looks as though all of the evil, all of the darkness is in everyone else. You listen to political debates. I'm not going to name any topics. Every side thinks it's righteous and holy and good, and the evil resides elsewhere. Every country, people think that, the, that it's the other countries which are evil. It's not us. We've got God on our side. Tom Weston talks about uh, an American politician uh, talking about nuclear, the possibility of nuclear weapons being... Uh, stationed in Turkey, um, and the Russians saying, uh, "Well, you can't have you can't have nuclear weapons that close to Russia." Uh, and this American politi politician saying, "But those are Christian nuclear missiles." Righteousness, self righteousness. 
So I displace all of that darkness and see it out there. That's why there's such glee in watching Thrame of Gones. Uh, you... <laughs> because I can't get rid of it. It's inside me. But when I pretend it's not there, I look for it outside. I draw, draw it to me on the outside. If I put the sin and darkness out there, the sin is displaced, the guilt is displaced, and the fear is displaced. If you're the baddie, the universe is retribution. The thunderbolt's going to come down and hit you, not me. It's a way of getting rid of that fundamental. It's why resentment is so attractive. It's a way of masking self-hatred because it's them that's the baddie now. It's why I enjoyed therapy for a while is because it was now my parents' fault. It was now my childhood's fault. I was off the hook. The fear went until it seeped back in. And... I was a holy innocent in a world full of creeps, full of attack. My, my mind would attack and attack and attack, attack the people in Tesco's, attack the people on the tube, attack my colleagues. I'd turn on the radio in the morning, listen to the Today probe, uh, and my mind would immediately start, immediately start attacking the people being interviewed, the people being quoted on the... Having, uh, have you ever had an argument with people on the radio, on the news or on the television, and, and it's, it's a temporary ointment, balm, and bandage for the real problem inside. But here's the thing with those attack thoughts. Why did I feel so undermined and attacked? Is because that attack was taking place inside my own mind, therefore the object of the attack. If, you're, if you've got explosions got going on in your mind, where, are you, where is the explosion going to be felt? In your own mind. So now you feel under attack, but it's you that's doing it. But you feel like it's coming from the outside, and it goes round in circles. The more I felt attacked, the more I'd have to attack other people. There's a line in A Course in Miracles, and it's, it's from Lesson uh, 153. It is, it is as if a circle held it fast, wherein another circle bound it and another one in that, until escape no longer can be hoped for nor obtained. Attack, defense, defense, attack became the circles of the hours and the days that Bind the mind in heavy bands of steel with iron overlaid, returning but to start again. There seems, there seems to be no break nor ending in the ever-tightening grip of the imprisonment upon the mind. And the attack mind that I lived in, that's a perfect description of it, just flipping back and forth between feeling attacked, feeling undermined, feeling low self-worth and my attack on other people. And all it does is it reinforces deeper and deeper and deeper the sense of separation and difference between me and other people, between me and God, between me and my true self. Uh, there's another little quotation here. Uh, from A Course in Miracles, where it talks about this attitude towards others. A brother separated from yourself, a murderer who stalks you in the night and plots your death, yet plans that it be lingering and slow, of this you dream. Yet underneath this dream is another in which you become the murderer, the secret enemy, the scavenger and the destroyer of your brother and the world alike. Here is the cause of suffering. You wonder where the cause of suffering is? This is chapter 27, Course in Miracles. There is the cause of suffering, the space between your little dreams and your reality. This is why in the big book, page 64, Resentment is the number one offender, because it's the activator of this whole system, which is why, and it's covered in another session, resentment must be unwound with forgiveness. Forgiveness is not retaining the perception that everyone is 
evil and nasty and toxic and narcissistic and all those things, but we must be nice and forgive them like good little children. No, 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 no. Forgiveness is the withdrawal of the demands that people be different, the withdrawal of the moralization, the development of compassion for other people, the development of empathy for other people, and you pray your ass off for about five years, and it'll happen. Plus amends, plus service. It's covered in other talks. Forgiveness, confession, amends, complete surrender to God and service. Um, Self will is the problem. This little, this little self I constructed in the world is my alter is the alternative that I chose in the place of my real self which is the child of God who's got a job to do in the universe, the intelligent agent, uh, uh, a spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation from the big book, We Agnostics. Um, So the real answer to lack of self-esteem is not to build up the self. It's to obliterate the self which has the esteem problem. It's to completely obliterate the sense of being a separate individual. If there is no self, the problem of high self-esteem, low self-esteem, poof, it's now gone. The problem has been eliminated because the problem is separation. Separation, a sense of separation will naturally bring about the darkness. And you can't solve that by pasting something on top of it. You've got to backtrack to the unity. And that's exactly what AA does with the forgiveness on page 67, the amends 76 to 83, chapter 7, the service of others, chapter 11, forming a fellowship with people you have nothing in, go- <laughs> nothing in common with except your alcoholism and your recovery. That's the answer. It's the loss of self. Step 11 prayer is about the loss of dis- the, the, the loss of self. Bill talks about the destruction of self-centeredness. Um, I've got some little quotations which I absolutely love, um, which I'm going to share with you because I think they're relevant on this. Um, but before that, just one, one little thing. Um, Rather than having self-esteem, what I need to do, and this is what I've consciously fostered for a number of years now, is universal respect and love for life and anything which is alive, including animals, including plants, um, uh, including all people, even the, f- the people you think are contemptible at some level, the worst criminals, the people who contribute the least to society in the, in the world's terms, the people who you think are responsible for the ills of the world. Until I've learned to love those people in the same way, and 12 and 12 talks about this, you've got to get rid of the idea that you love a few people a little bit, Um, you hate a few and are indifferent to the rest. That is the problem, the anxious apartness it talks about in step five in the 12 and 12. It's it's treating everything as one. And it's not just a little, you know, a a little um, nice little idea for a meeting. It's got to be practiced. It's got to be practiced by deliberately fostering those thoughts. There's a wonderful quotation from Earl Purdy, who's a Course in Miracles teacher, about this pretending that your darkness isn't there and then seeing it outside of yourself. And is, this is a transcript. I'm going to try and, try and get through it in one breath. Haven't you got a bunch of scripts for everyone around you who you're getting upset about if they don't follow them? That's why you're attracted to them. This person is doing the same thing to you. That's why you're with them. That's why you can't leave them. You're just like them. If you're in denial about your own ego, about your own selfishness, fear, or unconsciousness, then you have to deny it's there. So you can see yourself as being a nice person because everyone gives the appearance of being 
a nice person. And then you take the part of you that's not such a nice person and you project it onto the people around you. And then you see your own not nice person-ness in the people that you are close to. And the reason why you can't get away from them is that they're reflecting you back to you and you know that that's why it can seem like you're surrounded by people who are just the opposite of the way you think you are but you can't get away with from them for anything there's a part of you doesn't want to get away from yourself and they're also doing you the favor of mirroring back to you your own subconscious beliefs about yourself so you can be healed And this is the punchline. So if you see yourself as a nice person surrounded by people who have real issues, you have real issues, but you're telling yourself that you don't because you're nice. You're the nice one. You're so nice. Your face is just wet with tears about all the injustices that people do to people who are nice. You'd be nice all the time, wouldn't you as well, if they didn't just make you have to want to get them. It's brilliant, completely brilliant, that. Uh, That's Earl Purdy. So that's part of the problem. Back to the solution. This is from the big book, and this is from the medical view of AA, the little thing at the back. In this atmosphere, the alcoholic often overcomes his excessive concentration upon himself, learning to depend upon a higher power and absorb himself. In his work with other alcoholics, he remains sober day by day. The days add up to weeks and the weeks into months and years. Absorbing yourself is a wonderfully chosen word because it means that when I'm working with other, I talk to a lot of people in AA, I work with a lot of people. And I do it because that is my one of my primary ways of joining with someone else. It is the primary antidote to the sense of separation. And I feel amazing about myself, but only when I don't exist, only when I'm absorbed and dissolved into something. And there's a story by Anthony DeMello called The Salt Doll. Um, A salt doll journeyed for thousands of miles and stopped on the edge of the sea. It was fascinated by this moving liquid mass, so unlike anything it had seen before. What are you? said the salt doll to the sea. Come in and see, said the sea with a smile. So the doll waded in. The further it went, the more it dissolved till there was only a pinch left. Before that last bit dissolved, the doll exclaimed in wonder, now I know what I am. And that's exactly what I think we do in AA. We dissolve into the mass of AA. And in doing so, the problem of self-esteem disappears because we're part of something important. We're not the important thing. We're part of something important, which radically changes millions of people's lives and the lives of every person. How many people have I met since I've been sober where I've been able to contribute constructively to their lives because I'm number one alive, number two sober. Being sober for 29 years coming up has enabled me to affect thousands of people's lives positively. Anyone who is sober and keeps their nose clean will do that. We are affecting the lives of millions of people beneficially. It's being part of that that gives me an identity and esteem, being part of something bigger, not just AA, it's the the whole thing. Um, I'm just trying to find a little uh, quote. There's another quotation here from, and then I'll, I'll do the quotation, then I'll sum up, then we'll do some questions and answers if there are any. Um, in Chuck Chamberlain's A New Pair of Glasses, which is a transcript of a set of talks, the last section concerns, well, it's, there's a question and answer session. It, there are talks and then there's a question and answers. One of the questions is this. With self and ego taking over periodically, do I analyze and look for answers too much? And this is Chuck's response. You're a mess. If I were you, I'd just give up. I find so many of our people in AA, even in the grapevine, writing about self-esteem, 
building self-esteem. I hear people get up here and talk all the time about you have to learn to love yourself before you can love anybody else. He said, I'm most grateful this is not the case. I never spent any time trying to build up self-esteem or trying to love me. I wouldn't have taken me with a large dowry. I hated my damn guts. But I got busy doing things our book suggests. And it wasn't trying to learn how to self-esteem me or to love me so I could love you uh, or to love me so I could love you. I don't think that's the way it is at all. Francis says, for it is better to love than to be loved. It is better to understand than to be understood. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgiving that we're forgiven. And it is in dying to self that we awaken to eternal life. That's exactly what we've been talking about ever since we've been down here. Exactly what we've been talking about. I don't believe an image of me would add anything to my life at all. I haven't any more an image of me than I have of a walrus. I'm not interested in an image of me. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to share me with anybody that wants me in love and let the chips fall where they may. I'm not even interested in your opinion of what's happened, except when you want to give it to me. That's not my deal. I love you. And that's all I have to do. That's what I'm interested in. That's my deal. It's not my deal who you love or what you love or what you think. That's your deal. I love you, period. I don't even have to concern myself with what you think about me. I've got no image at all of me. And I think that's what I've found to be over the last 12 or 13 years, a very, very helpful ideal. So to sum up, um, I don't bother. I don't bother with the notion of self-esteem. I keep busy in AA. I look after myself very well. Why? If you're a delivery van delivering flowers, you've got to look after the van. I don't look after the van because the van is... I want people to look at the van. It's, the van is needed to do a, a, a good job. What I found is that service, uh, when that is my number one priority, the relationship with God and serving others, I will naturally want to, I will naturally treat myself as an important resource in doing that. I don't need to force a sense of identity or self by doing that. It's completely natural so um i've got a life which would suggest that i've got a lot of self-esteem but i don't consider myself to have on a good day i'm just dissolved into the wholeness of aa uh that's all i've got to say on that topic so patrick do you want to um take over for a moment uh, thanks, Tim. That was wonderful stuff. Thank you. It's always great to hear you, and I appreciate it very much. So um, what we'll do now is uh, right before we turn it back over to Tim for Q&A, um, a quick announcement. Uh, we have uh, sponsorship coordinators on the group. Anybody that you see as a host or myself or uh, the co-hosts, Vicky, Jules, and Aaron, um, uh, our sponsorship coordinators on this group, and we have a sponsorship WhatsApp, and they can put, if you're looking to be a sponsor or looking for a sponsor, they can put a notice on the WhatsApp group, and we'll try and hook you up, you know, as best we can. So, uh, yeah, we have, uh, they're standing by, so you can just send them a, a note, you know, in the, in the in the chat, you know. They'll get you fixed up. So, um with that, once again, it's a Q&A that's been recorded, So, uh, and the recordings will be available on the WhatsApp groups and the email list, and I'll put details about that in the chat if you want to join. And um, so, be, But be aware that your voice will be recorded, and if you prefer not to be recorded, you may send your questions directly to Tim in the chat. Um, please, uh, if you ask a question, just keep it brief. Um, it's, not an all, it's not a share, it's a question, so... You know, usually people can do that in less than a minute, but whatever you need to do, um, just be aware that large group. So with that, I will turn it back over to Tim to moderate this part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Aaron, do you want to come in with your question? Yes, Tim. 
you said you was reading a transcript. My brain translated as the mirror. Um, me being in a place around a group of individuals because they reflect a reality that I choose to grow from. Can you uh, give me a little bit more on that? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting, interesting question. Um, Anne Lamott refers to this plane, this planet, as forgiveness school. And in A Course in Miracles, it, it, it talks about a curriculum and the classroom as the world. Whatever situation I find myself in, seems to be the place where I'm to learn a lesson. And the lesson I learn is in all of the things that I see in other people that I don't like, because those will be reflections one way or another of things in me that I don't like that I'm pretending aren't there, which is why I'm bringing those things into my experience. One particularly striking area that happens, and if you have a lot of sponsees over the years, you'll see this. There'll be a particular type of sponsee you lock horns with in some way. And then you don't solve it. It doesn't work. You go your separate ways. The next one that comes along is exactly the same. And the next one and the next one. Uh, until you figure out what the lesson is and you think, right, I now know how to handle sponsees who do, who do this, who do... People like that will never come to you again because you've now learned the lesson. It's just like computer games with levels. So... Um, it's so interesting as well in this in step four in the page sixty seven questions. Um, although a, although a situation is not entirely my fault, you know, in the fear inventory, uh, I I set the ball rolling somewhere, which brought us uh, chains of events I I thought I didn't deserve. So I'm paraphrasing very badly there. <laughs> Um, page ooh, 62, so exactly the same idea, that uh, at some point you made a decision based on self. So I'm an unwitting creator, co-creator of the situations I find myself, the people who I bring into my experience. I'm vibrating on the same wavelength as. That's why they're there. There was a reason why certain things kept happening to me. I ended up being a victim in certain ways repeatedly until the lesson was learned and then it, certain things didn't happen again. So uh, it's interesting. Whatever I'm repressing in me, I seem to attract to myself in the world for me to learn a lesson. Uh, so we've, got, we've still got some time left. Um, if anyone has any more questions, either in, in the chat or, yeah. Second question. You mentioned forgiveness, which is for me to see the reality that I refuse to grow from. Then you mentioned compassion coming after forgiveness, then amendment, uh, making the amends. Can you elaborate on, on that again for me, please? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it, we, I, I think one can never talk too much about forgiveness. If there's one topic you can just talk endlessly about, it's forgiveness, because it's the whole thing. Forgiveness is the undoing of all of the illusions. Um, uh, one key element of forgiveness is recognizing, this is straight from the big book, uh, we were driven by a hundred forms of self-pity, self-delusion, fear. When I'm behaving badly, I'm driven. I'm in my separated self, fighting to the death, fighting everyone else on the planet to the death for my little gasp of specialness before my body finally expires forever. If other people are behaving badly, they're doing the same. People are not different. Everyone's on the same game here. So forgiveness is withdrawing the judgment, seeing things as they really are. 
Um, someone in the chat mentioned um, uh, amends as well. One of the curious things about amends, uh, the when I have done my utmost, as I have done, to straighten out my past, there is no longer any external evidence for the low self-worth to hang itself on as examples of why I'm wicked or bad or inadequate or whatever. Once all of the external evidence is gone, its true source becomes revealed, and then you get to choose. Am I going to rebuild the whole charade from scratch, or am I going to take that moment of insight? There's a dangerous crossroads at the end of step nine. But that's the point. The amends undo it because you realize that you are not the things that you did. And that's what came across to me from amend after amend after amend. It took away. It's like thorns being pulled out. And whenever I, I was on the verge of starting to love myself, in my early years in recovery, when I was, whenever I was on the verge of a breakthrough, in the back of my mind were a couple of things, my ongoing attack thoughts towards others and my, un, my unmade amends. So really, forgiveness and amends are very, very close. They're closely related. They're both about letting go of my narratives, which separate me from other people. In step eight, in the 12 and 12, it talks about how defective personal relations are, our, are, are the source of all of our problems, including our alcoholism. And then Sandy Beach, I mentioned this before, Sandy Beach, again, this can't be said too, too much. In any relationship, the problem is either I need to forgive or I need to make amends because those are the two forms the separation takes. When I forgive by withdrawing judgment and identifying with the person, uh, uh, Don P talks about this identification very much. He talked about a particular political event uh, where he developed rage for the people who were the perpetrators. And he asked God to show him, this is page 67, a kindly and tolerant view. And within a couple of weeks, he said to himself, if I'd been brought up in the same circumstances as those people, I might have done the same thing, thinking I, I had God on my side. So developing compassion for others, making amends to them uh, are the chief means. It, and, and it's interesting that I think it does need the very physical thing of making amends. It can't just be done in your head. You've got to go out there and interact with people to make this happen. Someone asked, where did this Earl Purdy quote come from? Um, I'm not sure what the date of the recording was, but if you listen to the many hundreds of Earl Purdy um, videos on YouTube, eventually you'll come across it. But the great thing about Earl, any other spiritual teacher, they repeat themselves a lot. So you'll hear the same idea pretty soon if you go and listen to, listen to him. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, How do you make the determination between, oh, this is, I suppose this is quite good. How do you make the determination between healthy self-care and dishonest self-obsession? Well, the, the trouble is with a lot of questions, the, pro, the problem lies in the bit of me that's asking the question. Um, there is almost no question in AA that can't be solved by simply applying pages 84 to 88 of the big book each day. So my question in the morning is, what God, what do you want me to do today? And I know whether what I'm doing, if I ask God, it's revealed whether I'm doing something out of vanity, avoidance, laziness, self-absorption or self-aggrandizement, or if I'm genuinely doing it, uh, as part of God's will. Trial and error, pages 84 to 88, asking God for direction and sitting there long enough to listen. And honestly, people, you know, I know people go on these great big sort of retreats to listen. Um, my experience, when I really ask God a question, if I'm willing to listen, I get the answer in eight to 10 seconds. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, 
I, you see, this is why the whole, the, the whole kind of outside in approach is a bit of a disaster. Why the big book talks about get you get yourself spiritually straight first. And from that, you go outwards into the world. I learned how to behave well towards me old mother when I got sober. I learned how to behave well, but I didn't resolve the, I didn't forgive her, not fully. I had some intellectual understanding. I didn't have any forgiveness in my heart, whatever that is. I, I, it didn't, it wasn't real. And so I behaved very well, but the relationship was incredibly tense at 15 years sober, my 15 years sober, the relationship was tense and fraught. And she knew there was a gap between how I was performing and how I felt. And it got to a step eight. I did the steps and I got to a, a step eight. Um, and I couldn't work out what I'd done wrong. No idea. Because I'd shown up for 15 years. I'd shown up. I'd been dutiful. I'd taken her to hospitals. I'd taken her to appointments. I'd remembered every birthday. I'd remembered Christmas presents. I'd done her tax returns. If she needed help, I gave her help. I advocated for her with doctors. I got her lawyers. I helped negotiate with the lawyers on various things. I helped her through my father's death. I looked after all, all of the, the financial affairs. I did everything. But something had gone horribly wrong. And I remember I was walking along um, Clerkenwell Road and I said to, to God, show me what I've done wrong in this relationship because I can't see it. And I mentally folded my arms thinking, well, let's see what you've got. Thinking there won't be anything there because I've been a good boy. And I almost heard a voice in my head which said, you spent the last 15 years being a fraud. There you go. You know. Yeah. I know when I've been unkind. I don't have to. It's, it's not a complicated question. If I'm honest with myself, I always know. By the way, the amend there, uh, uh, because one doesn't reveal um, unknown information, concealed information. It would have been devastating to her for me to say, yes, yes, over the last 15 years, I've been completely fraudulent. I never wanted to be here. I never wanted to be with you. Um, I felt unhappy and distant. I, could, I couldn't say that. So I said to the higher power, you're going to have to show me exactly what to do here to mend this, because I'm out of ideas. I'm already doing the things I'm supposed to do. How can I possibly, what can I do differently? And the higher power did something inside me to make the insides match the outsides so that my insides now matched the good behavior on the outside so that I was now congruent. Uh, the forgiveness of my mother took about two seconds. Uh, I was willing, completely willing, I knocked on the door. It was her 80th birthday. We went down to where she was living in the countryside, knocked on the door. The door opened and I saw someone I had never seen before. I no longer saw the image that I built up over decades, this crusty old image that I built up with, of her. I saw the real person. And in that moment, 40 or 38 years, whatever it was, of unhappiness went it's not a process, this. The preparation is a process, but the forgiveness in this case was an event. And frankly, forgiveness, it, it's these sudden insights, these sudden shifts which collapse space and time and leave you way further ahead than you could have got to by manual effort. This is not a manual effort thing. There's manual effort in the work in step four, in the work in step eight, but the shift happens as a gift from God. I can't explain that fully. I can't understand it, but I can report it. That's how forgiveness and amends um, seem to happen in my experience. Um, uh, Lynn. Oh, hey, thank you. Lynn, alcoholic. Um, I'm going to just, okay, I'm pulling over. <laughs> um, Lynn, alcoholic. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Okay. I have, I actually have four questions, but I'm not going to ask the fourth because it's a long one. I have three quick ones. One is, um, does this mean that I can no longer watch Thrame of Groans because I never got through all the seasons that I'd like to know, but I, I, I know I know what you mean, but it was it was okay. The the reader can, can I come on on that one? Otherwise, I'm okay. going to forget. I'm going to forget. Okay. So now that's very very interesting because what you mustn't do, I've been told, what you mustn't do is go into spiritual bypass and go la 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 la. I'm going to surround myself with love, love and light and little little tarot cards with angels on and lots of loveliness, and I'm just going to block everything out. Doesn't work. Uh, what I started to do was just do whatever I want to do, but be aware of what is going on inside me. Isn't that, fa- to, to watch it and say, isn't that fascinating that I'm enjoying this? What can I learn about myself? So it's not, a, you don't pretend it's not there. You don't punish it. You don't moralize. You go, wow, look at what I'm doing. Isn't that interesting? to be, simply become aware of what the ego is doing. And then over time, I got to a point where it was of no interest to watch it anymore. I want to watch something else. What was your second question? Thank you. Um, and, and then the second one you may have already answered. I got it mixed. Uh, the, that reading that you did about what we're really, when we're projecting onto somebody else, was that the one you said we need to go look at the videos about the yeah. particular per- okay yeah. shoot okay i liked that that was great um and then the third was okay so let's say you have uh somebody or somebody's who you deeply loathe um let's just say they're political and um <laughs> and i can I can, um, asking for a friend, of course, and I, I can, I, I have even found myself at times looking at some people and going, okay, I can see them as a child and I can have compassion as a child. But then when there are ongoing and very serious repercussions of today's behavior, and it it just seems like, okay, every time I feel like I'm getting to a place of more empathy and and sameness because i know that there's some of me somewhere i guess in there um and and then and then it comes back again and again and again because the behaviors have repercussions so what do i do with that is that also a spiritual bypass thing because i'm not going to just like go oh they're they're just like me i don't know anyway there's my question yeah okay so that's a really that's a really good question so there's a generalized question here about um uh uh forgiveness and and people's bad behavior when it's actually affecting things in the real world. Um, Al-Anon's very helpful here. It talks about uh, uh, if the baby is screaming and hitting you, you don't hit back, but you do hold it at arm's length. So... There's no inconsistency between taking concerted action in the world to make the world an easier place to live in, to um, to halt behavior which is aggressive or detrimental to others or destructive or divisive. One can act very, very robustly whilst forgiving. They're completely separate topics. In fact, to be super effective in handling jerks in the world, either individually or at society level or community level, uh, to be effective, you've got to be above the battlefield. You can't be on the battlefield psychologically because you won't be able to see straight. But there's got to be a fundamental fundamental detachment from the material plane. We, one's got to have one's head in the fourth dimension in the clouds with God and at the feet on earth, not the other way around. Not your feet in the air doing nothing and your head on the earth being kicked around by the jerks of the world. Uh, not with your feet in the air either doing nothing, sitting on a meditation cushion and being all cozy. It's, it's the, AA is brilliant because it's got the combination of both, which means you can deal with what is happening out there. But to remember there is a greater truth. 
that the whole message of the big book is about transcendence of the material without leaving it so that you're still in the world, but you're not of the world, which is what enables the uh, detachment there. Uh, I'm going to go on to someone else, Lynn, because there are lots and lots of different questions. Jenny Luvalia, would you like to come in with your question? Yes, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm an uh, alcoholic. Um, yeah, I, 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 I was quite interested with your um, point that you made about um, if people are, are annoying you, then it's something wrong with you. Um, I've got two people in particular in my life which give me backhanded compliments and are just generally not nice to me. Does that mean that I'm not nice? Or does it mean that I need to stand up for myself more? Those are good. Those are good questions. Where, <laughs> who's, when we say we're not nice, who is the we? My ego isn't nice. My ego wants to attack. It wants to secure specialness from people. People won't give it, and I attack it. That's not who I really am. You see, the danger with with starting to look at this is you can start. You can you can use any any spiritual tool any spiritual technique to attack yourself. This is about standing back. When I'm upset with someone, it's because my ego has decided I want something from them that they're not giving to me. There's a transaction which is not paying off. I'm demanding something of them that they're not doing. And I've got to look at that. But the, uh, here's the paradox. I can only look at what I'm doing there if I'm detached. If I'm so tied up with my ego, I'll be so full of shame at what I see, I can't see it. This can be why sometimes when people are doing step four, it's very common, you'll say, can you write your resentment inventory? Uh, you know, uh, Most people come up with 100 names, 200 names, 300 names. Sometimes people say, oh, I've come up with one person. <laughs> I'm fine with everyone else. It's because it's so frightening, the idea of looking at the, the violence of the ego. So you pretend it's not there. If you realize that you are not your own ego, then you can look at it because it's something you can get rid of without losing who you are yourself. We're getting to um, 7.30 uh, so, Patrick, I'm going to uh, just, if it's all right with you, just pick one more um, uh, one more question. Is that all right, Patrick? Because we're getting to the end of it. Oh, yeah, that's fine, Tim. Okay. Um, someone's asked an interesting question, which I think can be used to answer a lot of other ones. I have issues, the person writes, with self-esteem in business, with partners, where I have to value myself versus others. I feel I have to use things I find a about their actions to gain from them. As an inventor, I have no idea how to value intellectual property to compare value. What is the best way to go about giving away everything I have and gaining in business? Um, as I, the, 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 people often say that the, the answer to the question is, is not to give an answer. You've got to reframe the question. Uh, I have a little business and uh, I have to value the services that I provide to work out how much to charge. And I, la I do that just by looking at, there's a, there's a technical way of doing it by looking at what the market is doing. That determines the value. But that's not valuing me. Valuing something I do in a material sense is a completely separate question then my value as a human being, the service I provide has a monetary value, but that's just a technicality out there in the world. It's got nothing to do with me. I could be valuing turnips. I could be valuing neck of lamb. I could be valuing wood chips. It doesn't matter. It's a technical exercise. And, I, and this is the whole problem with ego is that I get so attached to my material identity that 
my st- as as my material life goes up and down, my stock value goes up and down with it. That's where it becomes deadly. I've got to be detached and separate from all of those all of those things. Um, Patrick, we've got to seven thirty, so I'm going to wind myself up there. Do you want to uh, do you want to pick someone to take us out with a serenity, Brad? Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.